what's good? Today I'm going to show you how production grade Next.js code bases handle the creation and consumption of forms. I'm going to be breaking it down into three different levels for ease of understanding. So without further ado, let's get to it. This first example is somewhat simple, but it's going to lay a foundation for how React hook form, Zod, and server actions all work together to create very developer friendly and type safe forms. So first you'll notice on the side here, we have this name input, and this is going to be our sole component for this first form. We can put in some string and press submit, and it's going to give us an alert and update the data in the database. So you'll also notice that if we delete enough characters, we're going to get this error message, which says name must be at least two characters. And if we press submit, it's going to re-highlight that input and we're not going to be able to actually submit the data. When creating a simple form like this, we're first going to start by defining the shape of the form data. And to do that, we're going to be using Zod. So if we take a look at this name schema here, you'll see that it's an object with this name property. This name is going to be a string of minimum length two, and we provide this custom validation error if that criteria is not met. You'll notice that it's the same message that we're displaying on the side underneath the input. Now that we've defined the shape of our data using Zod, we're going to use React hook forms use form hook to actually create the form. So this hook is going to help us manage the internal state of some of the components in our form, for instance, the input, and it's also going to provide some helper functions and some observability within this object that's returned. You'll also notice that within the config, we're going to be passing in this resolver prop, and this is going to tell React Hook Form to use this name schema to validate against any sort of payload it gets whenever we press submit or any other validation event occurs. Finally, you'll see that we're taking this z.infer generic from Zod to get this name schema, which we're going to pass in as a generic argument to this use form call. So this returned form object has a ton of different properties on it, but we're just going to be using it in three different ways in this first example. So you'll first see that we're calling this form.register method, which takes in a name of one of the keys of the Zod object to be passed in. So you'll see this is fully type safe because of that generic we passed into the use form call. And in this case, we only have name. So what this register function is actually doing is it's going to be spreading a whole bunch of properties that allow React hook form to monitor it. So the important ones here are on change, on blur, and ref. And so this is going to allow that React hook form hook call to see what's going on with that input and then also validate against that data. Now that we've registered all of our components with our form using this register method, we're going to use this form state property to check for any errors and display messages as appropriate. So in this case, there's really only one thing that can happen, which is we don't have enough characters in the name. So if we type just one thing in a and then press submit, we're going to get this name must be at least two characters. So this is because this form state recognizes that there's some error name and then displays the message within this P tag. The final property we're going to use on that form object is the handle submit function. So we put this on the on submit within our form and it's going to run the Zod validation against the payload and then call this final on submit function if everything passes. So we define this on submit function using this submit handler type, which takes in the generic name schema, same one that we passed into use form. Um, and this submit handler type is also exported from React hook form. So within here, you'll see that these values are fully typed based off that Zod schema. And we're gonna call the server action update name. So if we take a look in here, this is using the same name schema type, which we're going to infer. And you'll notice that this name schema is exported from a separate file schema.ts. The reason that we can't export it from the server action file is because, because it's a use server file, we're not able to correctly import it into the client. So we need to have a separate file, which we keep all of our schemas in. So both our client and server files can import from them. So back to the server action, you'll see very basic logic. We're just going to call auth from next auth and then parse the values using that same name schema. And then finally, we're going to update that user's name via Prisma and then return. The second form is going to build upon the first, but it's going to be slightly more complex. We're going to add better UI, better developer experience and enhance functionality. So just to demonstrate it, you'll notice that we have the same input on the side, but we also have this description and it's styled a little bit better. Also notice within this description, it says Ian Brash right here. If we go ahead and submit the form, it's going to save and you'll see we get this toast, but also this description changes. On top of that, if we refresh the page, you'll see that the input is pre-filled this time. Now, this is because we're using default values. So this default values parameter, we can pass into the config of use form and it's going to specify what the initial state of the form should be. And this is all type safe and it's based on the same name schema that we're using from the previous example. So where do these default values actually come from? 
you'll see that because we're in Next.js, we're going to be fetching them within the body of the server component in the page.tsx file. Here, we're just getting the user object from Prisma based on the next auth session, and then we're going to pass it in as the default values to this form too. Now that we know where these default values are coming from, there's one more thing we need to investigate, which is how this description updates based on the default values after we submit it. So this is because we're using the revalidate path function within our server action here. So this takes in the URL that we want to revalidate, and it's going to tell Next.js to essentially refetch that user data from Prisma now that we've updated it, and then pass it in again as default props. So it's constantly going to be updated every time we press save name. Besides default values, you're also going to notice that we're using the shadcn form component to render the UI. Now, this might seem a little complicated, but this is not only going to help you standardize how your form looks, but also how the React hook form use form hook binds to your components. So without getting too deep into it, this render method has this field property right here. And within that field property, you'll notice that we have on change, on blur, ref, and we also have value, which was not the case when we used the register function. This key difference changes your component from an uncontrolled component to a controlled one. And this really helps React hook form, especially for more complicated components than just a simple text input. The shad and form component is also just really nice looking. You can wrap it in a form item, then you get this label at the top. You get the description, and then this is going to be the error message that displays for any validation errors. If we scroll down a bit, you'll also see our next UI and functionality improvement, which is going to be using this form state dot is submitting boolean to disable the button or show a different message while it is submitting. So this is submitting boolean is true when we're waiting on that on submit function that we created right here. And as you can see, if we edit the name and press save name, it's going to wait a little bit and then disable the button and then finally return and you'll be able to click it again. If we look at this on submit function, you'll also see that we're using this toast method from Sonner, which tells our user that something actually happened. And it's just good principle to let the user know something happened with some visual feedback. This final form is going to show you how to bind many different types of React component types to the use form instance and also add even more functionality, UX, and developer experience improvements to it. Taking a look at the demo, you're going to see that we still have this input right here. So we can type in it as we please, and you'll notice that once we actually blur the input, it's going to say we have unsaved changes. On top of that, if we edit the input and we delete it down to zero, you'll see it immediately says that the name is required and it throws that error message. So if we reload the page, you'll also notice that it confirms that we actually want to reload the site because it knows that we've made changes to the form and it doesn't want us to accidentally reload the page and lose all of that data. Once again, we're using default values here. And if we go and delete everything again, you'll see that the error message doesn't actually appear on that first touch because they know that the user is typing and it's possible that you know the user knows that it can't be blank, right? But once we leave, that error message is gonna be triggered again. Finally, we have this reset form button right here, which we can click and then completely reset the form, resets the state, and then all of our data is back to normal. Of course, on top of the inputs, we have this select right here. We have this date picker. You can see the unsaved changes is still proccing right now. We have this different selection, and you'll see that we have disabled push notifications. So it says push notifications are not supported yet. We have this experience level two, and once it goes below 10% and we unblur it, you'll see that it says experience level must be at least 10%. We have this checkbox right here. And then finally, we have this public profile switch. Now let's break down all the changes we made in the code. So by far the simplest one is this use before unload custom hook that we've created. So we pass in this is dirty Boolean, which is from the form state, which means if the form has been changed at all or not. So we pass it in here and within use before unload, we have a use effect call and we add this event listener for the before unload, which is what happens when you try to close a page or reload it. And if this form is dirty, it's going to stop it, which is going to give us that error message like so. Next is the you have unsaved changes banner. So you'll see that this is simply rendered through this conditional React component right here using this has unsaved changes Boolean. So if we look at the definition, you'll see that it's using that same is dirty Boolean, but it's also going to be using this weird reduction of the dirty fields and then touched fields. So first we have to understand what touched means within the form context. So if a form is touched, it means that not only have you actually edited the stuff within it, but you've also blurred it. So without that, if we reload the page, if we edit this, this form is now dirty, but it's not touched. But if we leave, it is now touched. So this checks that if there are dirty fields and of these dirty fields, right, they've been touched. So that's why 
when we type in this, that unsave changes does not appear yet, right? Because once we unblur it, it becomes touched, and then this is true, and then this entire Boolean is true right here. This has unsaved changes Boolean is also used within the reset form button right here, as we can see. So within this reset form button, it's going to trigger this on reset function, which is going to call the form dot reset function. And this is going to pass in the default values and it's going to completely reset the state of the form, including whether it's dirty, whether the fields are touched, and it's going to replace that with the default values. Now let's look at how all of these different components work within the form field. So we'll start with the select. So here you'll see that we are taking the on change and the value and we're passing it into the select. I know this is default value, but according to the ShadCN docs, this is what you're supposed to do. But from my own testing, you can also just use the value here, which makes perfect sense to me. But we're going to use default value for now. We're going to put the ref and on blur on the trigger because that is what actually tells React Hook form when the form has been touched. So if we select something, you'll see that it is still selected right now. And then when we blur it, you'll see you have the unsaved changes. If we remove this on blur and then the ref, you'll see that it doesn't actually trigger that functionality. So if you go miss and then we blur it, it's not going to actually do anything. So that's why we need to add that on blur and ref. So once again, to reiterate the on change value on blur and ref from the field within this form field are extremely important and you need to attach them so that React Hook form can function properly. Date is similar in that we use this calendar component and then we have the field.value and then on change for the selected and on select. And then we also on the actual popover trigger, we're going to be putting the on blur and then ref props right here, which is going to be on a button. If we go down to the notification preferences, this is going to be a radio group. So we put the on value change, default value, on blur and ref all within that radio group. And then we can pass in those props as normal. We have the experience slider here. So we define the min and the max. And then also this value is going to be in an array instead, because that's just how the component works. And then the on value change will trigger the on change for that initial value because sliders typically allow you to have a left and right slider. Finally, for the checkbox and switch, we just pass in all the props to that component for the on blur, um, on check, change, check, etc. Uh, and then also for switch, we're going to be doing the same thing. However, you'll notice that we also have this on blur call here. So why do we do this? So if we take a look at this form and we check the marketing emails box, you'll notice that it doesn't say unsafe changes, right? And that's because this checkbox is actually focused right now when it's not blurred. If I click out, it's gonna say unsafe changes. However, I think that this is not very intuitive from a UX perspective. So if you want to actually change that functionality, you can immediately call on blur after the on check change, which is what happens for the switch. So if we click the switch, it's gonna immediately say you have unsaved changes. So I just wanted to put that in there to demonstrate that you can do it either way. I personally think this is more intuitive, but it's just personal preference. To top everything off, I'm just gonna be using next safe action here instead of a default server action. I have a video on that if you'd like to check it out. Super great library. But once again, we're just gonna be updating that user object and then also console logging the rest of the form data because we don't actually use it anywhere in our database. And this is where the schema is defined, also in schema.ts. We're using an enum for the title, enum for notification preferences, boolean for marketing and public profile, and then a date for birth date. And then of course, a number in between 10 and 100 for the experience level. And that's how you create forms that feel amazing from both the developer and user perspective. If you're interested in how to leverage NextSafe action for your backend form logic, definitely check out my video on that. And if you wanna see more content like this, please consider subscribing. Anyways, have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.